have a good idea of where some of the top undecided players are thinking about where they could potentially go, but we want to talk about what this means from a team perspective, so we brought in some help to do that. Andrew Ivins is here, and Andrew, it's good that you're here because we have some late-breaking news coming down the block. Tom Herman being named the head coach at FAU. How does that adjust things in the recruiting world? Well, Tom Herman, you know, he was at Houston a few years ago in his first class there. He signed a recruiting class that finished 35th in our rankings, and it included a few future NFL uh, players, Ed Oliver, Derek King. So I think when we look at this FAU, it's in South Florida. You know, there's a ton of talent within a three-hour drive from that campus. And yes, yeah, sure, things are different now with the transfer portal. But I want to know, how does Tom Herman attack his backyard? And do we see FAU, a school that has never really gotten in on some of these blue chippers, can he get some of them to campus like he did at Houston? So I think that's the big notable thing with Tom Herman to FAU. As if Florida recruiting wasn't already exciting, <laughs> let's just throw in Tom Herman to it. Meanwhile, with less than three weeks until signing day, every program wants to finish strong. But you've picked a few who maybe needed a little bit more than some others. Michigan State, Texas A&M, Ole Miss, and Utah. So when it comes down to the Aggies specifically, that historic class last cycle was always going to be tough to follow. But they're currently sitting at 24th for 2023. How do they make up ground in the upcoming days? I think they're going to have to close with some of these big fish that are out there. And I think with Texas A&M, no, what no one's really talking about is the fact that Jimbo Fisher, since he arrived in College Station, he hasn't been about the transfer portal. Over the past two years, they've taken just three guys, uh, three veterans from other schools. And we're seeing it right now. A lot of that number one ranked recruiting class, it's, it's entering the transfer portal and looking to leave. So to me, I think priority number one for Texas A&M is I got to hang on to David Hicks, uh, the elite uh, edge rusher from right there in the Lone Star State. He took a visit to Oregon. Uh, he's been at Oklahoma. They got to keep him in the boat because I already lost Anthony Hill, uh, another five star front seven defender. So they got to keep those guys and then, uh, you know, win some of these battles. I'm also wanting to know what they're going to do at quarterback Marcel Reed, a, a kid that's committed to Ole Miss. He's starting to get linked to the Aggies. Uh, what I like about Reed is the fact that he's really dynamic with the ball in his hands. He's springy. He can run around. And we all saw Texas A&M's offense this season. They're changing coordinators. I think they need a new answer under center. And Marcel Reed, this is a guy that almost ran for 1,000 yards on Friday nights this past season. I think he would add a different element to that quarterback room. Yeah, Andrew, Ole Miss, you mentioned them potentially losing Marcel Reed. They're outside the top 25 nationally in the bottom half of the SEC. We've seen Lane Kiffin. This is his part of the season, right? Flip miss. You got transferred to the SIP. A bunch of nice, cute little slogans. But what's your outlook on the Rebels as we approach signing day? Well, they're sitting 26th in the rankings. More notably, they're ninth in the SEC. And this is a team that started off 2022 7-0, right? Then they stumbled to 8-4. and four. Uh, But Lane Kiffin, he's not going anywhere. Uh, people thought he was going to take the job at Auburn. He signs this big extension. Now they need to add some talent. And, and it's funny, Blair, I wrote those two phrases down. He talks <laughs> about transfer to the, uh, to the SIP. But what about what about Flip Miss? Remember when he had that sweater and, and, they, and they were busting out the I'm Steve still Wolf waiting for mine, by the way. <laughs> well, I, two names I got circled, right? Dante Dowd, mm -hmm. in-state running back. Okay, this is a kid committed to Oregon. He's been to Oxford multiple times. I mean, I think it's a pretty easy sell uh, for the Rebels. Hey, look what Quinshawn Judkins did here as a true freshman for us. Uh, he got touches, and, and they played two running backs. Zach Evans got got a ton of touches as well. Dakari Nelson's another. He's a, a safety out of Alabama that's currently committed to Penn State. He's visited a few times, but I think Lane Kiffin and his guys got a few surprises up their sleeves, and it's going to come down to the flips. We know they're going to be in the portal, but they need to flip some guys and move up in that rankings. Yeah, no guy unafraid of the portal is Mel Tucker, but his 2023 class is 30th right now. So the pressure is on to get that up, especially after the disappointing five and seven season. So how important would even just going into that top 25 be helpful to Michigan State as they look to gain momentum headed into next season? Let's be honest, Mel Tucker is not going anywhere, right? And you, and you touched on what he did in the transfer portal. I think with the Spartans, the biggest thing is 
you know, they, they have to draft well. And if you look at the transfer portal as free agency, well, then the NFL draft is high school recruiting. And you got to get guys that you can develop in there. I like some of the pieces they already have in place by Job, Jordan Hall, Jalen Thompson. Those are all, uh, you know, point of attack players. But uh, they need to add some pieces elsewhere. Oregon quarterback commit Dante Moore. He's the name that all Michigan State fans know with Kenny Dillingham, uh, the Ducks OC now at Arizona State. Does that open the door for Mel Tucker to make a move? I mean, Michigan State doesn't have a quarterback right now. And then one other guy I, I, I've circled here, Eric Singleton. He's a, a, a unknown wide receiver out of Georgia, a kid I really like who's actually committed to Western Kentucky. He's going to take an official visit to East Lansing this weekend, had over 1,100 yards as a senior, 18 touchdowns, and he's got 10-6 speed on the track. You know, Michigan State, they're going to add some mercenaries from other college programs, but again, you got to develop the high school ranks. Eric Singleton's a guy that I think you take, and he can make an impact with his wheels there in the Big Ten. Yeah, Andrew, you look at your list and one school that leaves you scratching your head is, is Utah, considering the the impact that they've had not only on the field, but in the recruiting trail with recent cycles. They were at the Rose Bowl last year. They're in contention to win the Pac-12 with a game against USC later this week. What's your outlook on the Utes as they sit outside the top 40? Blair, you know this better than anyone else. I mean, Utah is a player development program. It's never been about the stars, but when I look at the Utes, I mean, they're 28 and 12 the past four seasons. You said it, they're in the Rose Bowl. They're going to play for a Pac-12 title on Friday night. I think if there's a time to take advantage and get some blue chippers on campus, it's now. We just saw them win a four-star offensive lineman. And I, I want to know how these next few weeks go. Smith Snowden, in-state cornerback who has all the tools. Uh, Utah leads on the crystal ball there. Then you got Spencer Fano, top 247 offensive tackle from right in their backyard. He's going to announce uh, in a few days, Utah battling a, a ton of different schools. But Kyle Whittingham, man, flex your muscle on the recruiting trail right now. Say, hey, come to Utah. You're going to play on the biggest stages. Walker Lines is another guy that uh, just recently decommitted from Stanford. You have Hunter Clegg, a, a Stanford commit. Uh, Utah and Stanford always go at it on the recruiting trail. And, and guess what? David Shaw's out. So there's a time for Utah to capitalize on all this stuff and get maybe that level of player that's a little bit better than what they're used to getting. I think that can lead to success, long-term success there at Utah. I certainly hope so. It will be an exciting next couple of weeks, and you will be all over it. Thank you so much, Andrew. Blair, of the four schools we just talked about, who do you think is in the best position to close strong? Yeah, I do think it is the Utah Utes, considering that they have a chance tomorrow to beat USC in Las Vegas in the Pac-12 Championship. That would really catapult, I think, their recruiting efforts because they are a player development program, but they've ascended that. They've surpass that now they can go after the four and five star prospects and potentially win a battle against some of these higher profile schools i, I do think he you know that that utah has a chance with a number of of, of big in-state prospects he mentioned walker lyons and hunter clegg who we talked about going to armenia next summer uh i think they are set up nicely it's in their dna to close strong and hold a lot of their spots later for the cycle so i, I like where the utah utes are set up right now <laughs>